Yes, I'd like to speak to Mr. Mort Abrams, please. Who's calling, please? My name is Jay Allen Sanford. I'm a writer for Midnight Marquee Magazine. Pardon me? Oh. Hi, Mr. Abrams. Yeah. Yes, I'm writing for Midnight Marquee Magazine. I'm doing an article on the old Tales of Tomorrow series. Oh, yes. Where are you calling from? I'm calling from San Diego. Would this be a good time to talk to you and ask you a few questions about yeah, the series? Yeah, sure, go ahead. All right. Uh, first of all, I was wondering how uh, how the series, what the genesis involved was. I know it was a George Portland production, and you were the producer? Yes, that's Previously been involved with Rock Hill Productions, uh, some other science fiction TV shows. Was that a company? Now, Rock Hill, Rock Hill Radio was uh, the first television series I ever did was called Tom Corbett Space Cadet, mm -hmm. and in that I worked on that series, on which I produced. I worked with. A Rock Hill Radio. They were a sort of ad agency uh, at the time. This was all, as you know, in the days when television was just beginning. Sure. Nobody quite knew what, what, who did what to whom. Mm -hmm. um, but that was Tom Corbett's Space Cadet. After Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, we got me interested in science fiction. Robert Heinlein had written Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, the book. And Heinlein became one of the members of the Science Fiction League of America. Mm -hmm. And then my second television production was Tales of Tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So that's how that all came about. 
So you actually formed the Science Fiction League of America yourself? Uh, yeah, I've been, uh, yes, I formed that myself. I see. Yeah. Now, the series was broadcast live. Yes, that's right. From uh, ABC, ran a couple of seasons. Uh, what was James Lister's involvement? I haven't been as co-producing. James uh, Lister? Yeah, James Lister has unfortunately passed away. Uh, he was a... Uh, was my assistant and casting director. I see. How about Dick Gordon? What would be his involvement? Ah, uh, that's Dick Gordon was George Foley's partner. Uh -huh. it was, the company was called Foley and Gordon. I'm sorry, it was called Foley what? And Foley and Gordon. Oh, uh, Foley and Gordon. And Gordon was uh, was George Foley's partner. I see. Yeah, they had another show on the air, an afternoon game show. For. Uh, but they were like a packaging company. Mm -hmm. uh, how were the particular stories that you chose to do, how were they chosen? Did you talk to the actual authors themselves? Did you leave no, it to... No, I had, uh, you know, I had become a science fiction buff by that time. Mm -hmm. And I had read almost all of the material. So I knew, uh, you know, kind of what I was dealing with. I made the selection myself. Uh, both from the available material from the Science Fiction League and from uh, material sent in um, or given to me by or assigned by me to writers. Uh, most of the material, as time went by, turned out to be original material mm -hmm. by writers who, <coughs> some of whom are still around. Sure. And That's very okay. familiar with these very successful writers. Frank uh, DeFolita is one of the Frank talking DeFolita, to Frank DeFolita, yes. Uh, Man uh, Rubin I just talked to earlier. Pardon me? Uh, I just talked to Man Rubin earlier today, in fact. Oh, Man Rubin did quite a few. Yes. Frank DeFolita, you won't find. He's in Yugoslavia. Oh, really? Yeah, he's, uh, he just finished directing a picture and they're scoring up there. We're still very good friends. Oh, I see. Uh, what about Charles O'Neill? Um, yes, O'Neill. I, I don't know what happened to O'Neill, but he supplied quite a bit of material. Mm -hmm. uh, Mel Goldberg? Mel Goldberg, I'm still friendly with. He's out here. Mm -hmm. uh, he did quite a few, yeah. He's one that I was looking to get in contact with. I have his agency number. I'll be contacting them real soon. Uh, they can forward me through, hopefully. Um, yeah, I'll, I'll give you, let me give you Mel's phone number. All right, that'd be terrific. Yes, yeah, sure. He's very nice. Very, very nice man. I'm sure he'll be very helpful. Directors, I understand he's Don Medford, yeah, yeah, Don directed all of them. I think all, or... Uh, nearly. I know Leonard Valenza did a couple. Yeah, that's that's true. I'd forgotten about him. Mm. He mentioned his name. But Don did by far. The, I mean, I, he probably did 70 of the 80-odd. Mm. He's teaching Don at UCLA. Don is still active uh, directing television. Mm -hmm. He's still in the, uh, actively involved in the business, although I haven't spoken to Don in about five years. Mm. Uh, did some of the authors whose stories you did, did they, uh, did say like Arthur C. Clarke or Frederick Pohl or Ted Sturgeon, did they write any actual scripts or treatments? Uh, no, I don't think so. I, uh, I'm, I'm really not sure. Ted Sturgeon might have. Mm -hmm. Ted, as you know, died recently. Yes, indeed. Uh, I know Asimov didn't write any. I know... I think Ted might have been the only one who did. I have a list of the of the material in my office. Well, you probably have a list of the show. Yeah, in fact, uh, the copyright holder, Wade Williams. Wade Williams, uh, yeah. A, he has a list of all the different writers that he's yes, going to be forwarding right. to me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did any of these authors give you feedback on the episodes you did based on their stories? Uh, no, no. I don't recall any instance of anybody... Uh, of any of the authors commenting to me one way or the other. Hmm. What episodes then would you remember most vividly? It's funny, talking to um, 
the people I've spoken with, everyone seems to remember the window. Yes, it's right. Being a real standout. Yeah, that was uh, that was written by Frank D. Felita on a bet. On a bet, really? Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah, he and I had a bet. Uh, we, used to, we used to challenge each other because uh, that was uh, unfortunately in those days you could you could do that. Uh -huh. You worked 20 hours, but you laughed a little. Uh, I made a bet with him that he could not write something. Uh, excuse me. No. Excuse me. No problem. Uh, sorry, give me your name again. Pardon me? Give me your name again. J. Allen Sanford, S-A-N-F-O-R-D. Um, referred to as J? Yes, uh-huh. Hi, uh, we. I made a bet with him. I challenged him to write something that could only be done on live television. It could not be done in theater could not be done on film, it could not be done, it, it, the only medium in which it could be done was live television. Uh -huh. And I bet him at dinner, <laughs> and he went, <laughs> went home uh, to think about it, and called me up a couple of days later and said, I think you owe me a dinner. Uh -huh. And I said, not till you tell me what it's all about. Uh -huh. And he came in and he explained it to me, and I thought it was just a great idea. Mm -hmm. There was only one problem. Are you familiar with the... With the oh, yeah, I have a copy. Okay. The problem was, since it's a reality piece, it was kind of war of the world. Sure. The big problem was, how are we going to integrate commercials? Hmm. I spoke to Bob Lewin, who was the agency representative, and he loved the idea. He thought it was just terrific. And uh, I said, can, can I do commercials at the end and the beginning of the half hour, before the story begins and after it ends. Uh, and he said, no, you can't do that. They're not going to, the sponsors will stand for it. You have to put them in their regular places. And I said, Bob, uh, you can understand how it's going to ruin the reality if we suddenly... So he said, no, I'm sorry, but I, you know, I'll talk to them, but I'm sure they're going to say no. And he talked to them and they said no. So I had to figure out a way to get the... Uh, commercials in, and but you saw the result. Mm -hmm. It was Bob himself on the floor saying to me, to I don't care commercial. what happens, I want my commercial. Right, which is pretty uh, great. The, the switchboard at ABC lit up, uh, despite our disclaimer. That there it was, was a not, disclaimer? Uh, well, we have a disclaimer on the, uh, that it was not a true, it was not a true. The, the kinescope that survives shows the beginning commercial and then the lost planet, you know, a little red herring, but the, 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 the disclaimer isn't on the kinescope. Oh, well, isn't that interesting? I've never mm. seen the kinescope. Huh. Uh, although, uh, no, I don't have a copy Robert Lewin tells me that uh, in Cincinnati they actually pulled it off the air because they were afraid a murder was going to take place. Uh, well, they, thought, they pulled it off the air in Cincinnati, and I thought they pulled it off the air in Boston as well. In Boston, huh? Now, I think, if I remember correctly, that there was a real brouhaha about it, and the next week we were off about eight or ten stations refused to carry the program. Really? Until it all quieted down, and then the following week everybody returned to the fold. Uh -huh. But it was a big, uh, there's also a very interesting casting problem, because we wanted people new in order to create the reality, and here's where Jim Lester uh, came into play as a hero. We needed new faces mm -hmm. uh, because uh, it increased the uh, concept of the reality of this right. piece. Rod Steiger, as I recall, is one well, of the Well, the problem, <laughs> yes, the problem was that Rod Steiger, was, I think it was his first or second appearance on television. The big problem was Frank Maxwell, who played the husband, right. who had been on television several times. So we disguised him with that, I think we put some plaster over a supposed bruise, and we doctored, his, doctored up his nose so it didn't quite look like Frank. Huh. And then Virginia Vincent, who was relatively new. Mm -hmm. um, but Steiger, of course, was the big surprise because he was so wonderful. And, yeah. You know, he was he was so new, nobody knew who he was. Yeah, he's scary in that. Uh, yes. He's a tough character. Yeah, it's a very interesting piece. 
we had mm. we had great fun. Is it true that the police came onto the set? Uh, no, no, not really. Not really. We no. was under the impression that, that was the case. They actually came by looking for uh, where the murder was going to take place. Oh, uh, we did get we did get two policemen who came in after. Ah. Uh, and want to know what all the fuss was about. I see. So their switchboards were lighting up too. Oh uh, yes, they, they absolutely were. Oh. Uh, one of the actors that a lot of conflicting stories has abounded about is Lon Chaney Jr. when he did the Frankenstein episode. Mm -hmm. I'm told by some that he was so drunk that day that he forgot that he'd already had a dress rehearsal and was under the impression that the live broadcast was a rehearsal. And that well, that would explain... can I cop out on that? Pardon me? Uh, can I cop out on that? Oh, that's no problem at all. <laughs> I mean, the, the, the poor man is dead. Yeah. So, uh, if you don't mind, it's no comment. That's no problem Which at I all. Think, I think uh, is an answer to you. That's no problem. Right. Uh, the music for the series. Some episodes, I noticed, actually had original music, but I take it most were uh, canned? No, I'll tell you an interesting story about the music to that show. It was all from library. Uh -huh. And the guy who selected the music and spun the records was Jerry Goldsmith. Really? Jerry kept after me for virtually the two years of the saying, please let me write an original. Uh -huh. And I was paying Jerry $75 a week, sorry, per show. And I said, I don't have any money for musicians. Uh -huh. uh, I'd love you to do it, Jerry. I can't pay you. I can't pay the musicians. So I'm in a bind. Finally, uh, uh, he did had done such a good job, and he was such a wonderful, still is, wonderful guy, that I had um, a Western written, and uh, I asked Jerry if he could, how inexpensively could he do live music for that one piece, and uh, the piece was an, an inexpensive one to produce. So I had a few dollars extra, I think $125. And he said, let me work something out. And he, what he did was he composed a score with um, a guitar and a harmonica. Mm -hmm. And somebody whistled. And it was a wonderful little piece. And I think it was Jerry Goldsmith's first original composition. Huh, no kidding. I know he went on to do Thriller a few years later, one of the other TV shows before he uh, became famous. Oh, yes, he did a lot of television. Um, I've got down in some of the credits that Bobby Christian was involved in the uh, music. Bobby Christian? Mm-hmm. And there's, there's one episode that lists original music compositions by Lou White. Oh, Jay, you got me. That's, <laughs> it's a long you time. You really ago. got me. I don't know name is just That's Bobby Christian is totally, hmm. totally unfamiliar. And original music by Lou White. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm a little unclear as to whether or not you had um, the same announcer for the episodes that had introduction. Was it Roger DeCoven? Yeah, uh, no. Uh, no, it wasn't Roger. Oh, wait a minute. Yeah, it was no, it wasn't Roger DeCoven. We did have the same announcer for each segment. But his name wasn't Roger DeCoven. I know Roger DeCoven, but that he was not. Hmm. Oh, boy. Can, cannot remember who the announcer was. That's something I'm sure I can dig up in my research. I don't know. Was the same announcer all the way through? Was it? Did Did you ever have any problems from the uh, network regarding script content besides uh, this episode with the window? Uh, no. Uh, the, actually, at that time in the history of the business, the network did not really control programming. The sponsors did. Mm -hmm. And uh, while the network had a right, obviously, to complain or, you know, to 
make things life difficult and difficult if they want. They they stood back, back because it was the uh, it was the year if you remember of uh, shows like Armstrong Circle Theater and Chrysler Medallion Theater and you know where the name of the sponsor was integrated into the title Goodyear Playhouse, etc. Uh, so it was a sponsor that I controlled the contest, and if you were going to have any problems, it was the, you had it with your sponsor. Uh, and the only one that, only program that I did that ha I had some little problem with, with was uh, uh, an uneasiness on, uh, on, on the window. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now let me think for a minute. Uh, No, I'm sorry, I'm just trying to think if there were any. No, I, I really didn't have any problems. Good. Um, you, you've done other science fiction and fantasy uh, type projects. I know you co-wrote Beneath Planet of the Apes. Yeah. Uh, there's an interesting anthology series I've looked up called uh, Windows from 55 and 56. Which Windows was a, yeah, that was my program. Mm -hmm. That was, was with Leonard Valenza, replaced. wasn't it? Pardon me? Was that with Leonard Valenta as well? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a summer show. I see. That we just did one summer to replace some show that had been canceled or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I think I did 12 episodes of that. Mm -hmm. And the best one was, one I remember, was a short story by Ray Bradbury. Hmm. About a sideshow, a rundown, rinky dink kind of small carnival. Mm -hmm. And there was a midget. Oh, the dwarf. Dwarf. Sure, I know that one. That's the one. That was my favorite. I remember that mm. so well. That's a terrific story, uh, the dwarf yeah. looking in the mirror that makes him tall. That's it. Oh, oh you're well versed. You yeah. did the homework. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's the one. Huh. Um, how yeah, would you, I, I did those, uh, those shows, yeah. Well, how would you compare some of the other anthologies you've done, like uh, Windows and Suspicion, uh, General Electric Theater? How would you compare those to, say, Tales of Tomorrow? Well, GE Theater was a whole other kettle of fish. It was, um, you know, big budget. It was, uh, yeah, as you know, Ronnie Reagan was the host. Uh -huh. uh, it was... Uh, it, it represented a big, big move for me in terms of having money to spend, as I had practically no money. My entire staff on Tales of Tomorrow was Jim Lister part-time, a secretary half a day, and myself. Huh. So I had a cot in my office because I frequently, I spent three, at least three, four nights a week uh, sleeping in the office. No kidding. Hmm. And I had to turn out copies of with a hand-cranked mimeograph machine <laughs> <laughs> and uh, had to have them delivered to the actors and I didn't even have money to have them delivered by messenger or by cab. They had to be delivered by whoever was available to me mm -hmm. uh, by bus and uh, subway. Huh. I mean, it was really, it was really skinny, pants, yeah. skinny money time. Huh. General Electric, I had a you know, considerably inflated budget, and it was a whole, there was a whole different approach there. I see. Uh, it was a very important uh, series in terms of, General Electric was the first dramatic anthology ever to get in the first uh, 10 of the top Nielsen rated shows. Really? I didn't know stayed that. there for about 10 weeks, which was record, all-time record. Huh. And it was designed to introduce important stars. Sure. And um, uh, the first year, half of the show was on was live, which I did from New York, and half was on film. Sorry, first year all the all the shows were live. Then they went to half live, half film. Mm -hmm. 
and I was the executive producer of the film half and the producer of the live half. Uh, then the concept of the General Electric Theater changed, and it went into um, other hands, and it was not, and Ronnie Reagan wasn't the host anymore, and it, it, the whole thing changed. Uh, but when you have more money, obviously, you've got freedom and you can look further apart to your story material and your actors, etc., etc. And you did GE Theater shortly after Tales of Tomorrow? Or was that before? No, GE Theater was after. I did a couple of shows in between. I did, I think the show that I did after Tales of Tomorrow was the Chrysler Medallion Theater. Mm -hmm. An anthology, I was a specialist in anthologies. Mm -hmm. And then I was simultaneously the executive producer of the Campbell, Campbell, I think it was called, Campbell Soundstage, I think. Mm -hmm. Another dramatic anthology. Mm -hmm. And then came General Electric Theater. And then recently you've done some HBO uh, movies, Deadly Game. Oh, yeah, that's fairly recent. Yeah. Uh, when Tales of Tomorrow was on, yeah. did you get much press? Uh, like TV Guide, did any of the magazines mention it at the time? Yeah, yeah, we got we got considerable press. I don't remember that TV Guide even existed at that point. Huh. What about ratings-wise? What did it do? Uh, oh, we did very well. Good. Yeah, we were we did very well. Everybody was very happy with the show. Why wouldn't it have been picked up for a third season then? Was there a specific reason? Uh... The primary uh, sponsors, uh, Masland and Chrysler. Uh, Chrysler, I believe, I, Masland Carpet, I believe, was taken over by another carpet company. Mm -hmm. And Chrysler was having some pr internal financial problems, which they, I believe, subsequently solved, but they, the company went out of business. I don't know whether they sold it or it failed or what happened to it. Uh, but their own economic problem, uh, they did, they never sponsored another show. Oh, I see. Uh, it's just that, you know, as, as thin as the money was, it was too much for them to carry. Mm. Well, how would you compare the show to later uh, similar anthologies like Twilight Zone and Outer Limits? Did you get a chance to see many well, of I those? think in, in, in a sense, uh, uh, they were an outgrowth of Tales of Tomorrow. Sure, I would agree. But uh, the technology changed. Mm -hmm. Those film, those shows were on film. Uh, the acting, the direction, the camera work uh, of Tales of Tomorrow now looks very old, and indeed it is very old-fashioned, right. uh, and much more, much less sophisticated. They were naive, mm -hmm. uh, in, in, and rep represented uh, the technology and the techniques of those days. But those days were replaced by more sophisticated uh, uh, systems of delivery, uh, equipment, and indeed different of acting and direction and camera work. Mm. Uh, Do you feel your show ever gets sort of the short shrift uh, as far as uh, not getting a lot of attention like Twilight Zone did? And uh, no, did? I, I never felt that. I felt, uh, well, I have a personal philosophy about the business that uh, what's important is how you feel about your own work. Mm -hmm. And uh, a claim comes from, in, in my business comes from combination of PR and, um, and and other forces not necessarily related to the quality of the work. Mm -hmm. um, I was very happy with Tales of Tomorrow. Um, I consider myself a pioneer. Mm -hmm. um, I loved doing it, hard as it was. I loved the results. And, I'm, and that self-satisfaction is what makes it um, okay with me that nobody gave me any gold flags. <laughs> I, I, I would have liked them, of course, sure. but I'm not disappointed that I didn't get them, and I have no hostility or bitter feeling. Uh, uh, Rod, um, 
Rod Serling, in fact, got his basic training from me uh, and went on to, um, and indeed, uh, dedicated his book, uh, Patterns, to me. Really? Huh. So, uh, you know, I mean, there's a great deal of satisfaction in that kind of thing. In what way do you mean he got his education from you? He worked with you uh, early on? Oh, yes. I didn't realize that. What show would that be? Yes, he was in Cincinnati at that time. And uh, was writing from Cincinnati, and I was the one who kept encouraging him to come in. Um, uh -huh. And uh, was writing from Cincinnati, and I was the one who kept encouraging him to come in um, to live in New York. I see. And when he came in, I introduced him to other people and was supportive of him because I was a great believer in his talent. Mm -hmm. And when he wrote a book called Patterns, which is included the screenplay of his of his um, uh, the, the script of his of his play called Patterns, mm -hmm. uh, he says in his foreword that you know he he credits me with some with a great deal of his uh, success, mm -hmm. which was very sweet, and that's that's more satisfying than uh, another award. I've got plenty of awards. I see. Were you on the sound stage often uh, during the filming of the Tales of Tomorrow? Yes, I was always, always there. And uh, were there any outstanding uh, instances of, say, flubs or uh, goofs or any anecdotes regarding yeah, the stars? Yeah, we did uh, a show, a name of which I don't remember, um, with Robert Keith. Oh, sure, the, the appointment, on appointment, right. appointment on Mars. Appointment on Mars. Appointment on Mars. Yeah. Uh, that's what happened at the end of the show was that um, Nielsen, Leslie was supposed to pull a gun uh -huh. on Keith. I, I just read an interview with Nielsen where he mentions that. He says he's shot in the chest, and then he still has to strangle Keith to death because his gun won't work. And, uh, yes, it's called what happened was his gun fell out of the holster, uh -huh. and he didn't have a gun. <laughs> <laughs> and I stood... I am sure pale and shaking in, in, the, in the control room with the director, and I remember Don and I looked at each other, and, and, and we just didn't say anything. Our hearts were in our mouths. How is this thing going to end? And they were both the consummate professionals. Simply <laughs> went at each other hand to hand, which is, was not in the script at all, and hmm. remarkably ended their fight with a mutual death exactly when the program should have concluded. Yeah, I just watched that one, in fact, and it's amazing how they pull it off. It's Crazy. incredible. And they, who wrote that now? Uh, let's see. Appointment on Mars. Um, hold on a second. Someone named S.A. Lambino. Yeah, I remember the name, but I don't remember him. Yeah. But what he did, I remember he called me the next day, and he said, gee, I don't know why you changed the ending of my play. <laughs> he said, I thought, it was, I thought it was good, but I have to tell you that I don't mind that you changed it because your ending was better. Oh, that's fantastic. What a great story. And I, I told him that. I told him what happened. Huh. Uh, there's another one I understand with Lee J. Cobb called Test Flight. Yeah. He, he got stage fright, apparently, and forgot all of the first few pages of script. I don't remember. Hmm. That was one that Louine told me about. That, that, could, that um, could very well be. How about the episodes Boris Karloff did, Past Tense and Memento? Is there anything notable about his uh, stint? Uh, cast? No, Karloff was a wonderful man. And nothing, you know, particularly noteworthy. Mm -hmm. Uh, James Dean, I understand, did an early television role in the Evil Within episode, which uh, Rod Steiger did as well. Are there any any remembrances of, of his uh, his work? I tell you, my memories of those days is so. It's, it was only a few months ago that I learned that I produced Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward's first television shows. Yeah, with that we just watched that one with Paul Newman. Uh, yeah. The Ice from Space. I, I didn't know that that was Paul's first show. 
I didn't realize that much. I knew it was one of his earliest, but yeah, uh, I wasn't no, sure if that was his very first. Somebody called me a few months ago because he was being interviewed. Uh -huh. and, he, and the interviewer said, what was the first television show you did? And he said, a thing called Life in Space on a series called Till. I mean, and I didn't even, I, I, I'd forgotten it. And Joe had two. He only has like four lines in it. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. Yeah. Um, Jim. Listen, Jim, I've got to, um, uh, my wife is, all right, well, I'm, I didn't mean to hold giving you up. Me a, giving me those baleful glances that wife give when yeah. dinner is ready. Well, I appreciate the time you took for me. It's been a very big help. Not at all. Uh, if there's anything special, you know, uh, feel free to call me back. Sure. I, I go ahead and forward a copy of the uh, finished article to you, if you like. Yes, I would appreciate uh, that. I believe I have your representative's address here. Let me check and make sure. Uh, Morty Abrahams, you're still represented by the Barry Perlman Agency? No, no, why don't you send it to my office? All righty, let me get that address from you. It's, uh, you okay? Mm-hmm. 4063 Radford, R-A-D-F-O-R-D, Radford Avenue. Okay. Uh, number uh, 208. All righty. Studio City. Nine one six zero four. I'll go ahead and forward that along to you. And um, again, thanks for all your help. It's not really, at all. Really flushed out the article nicely for me. Thank you very much. Thanks again. Bye right. bye now. Bye bye.